We're in the studio at Teachers College at Columbia University, and I'm talking to Premalyn Nadison, a professor of history at Barnard College of Columbia University, and an expert on the late 20th century welfare movement and also on organizing poor people. If Poverty, inequality, uh, if those are really core issues in the United States, how would you say they emerge in the 1960s? I think there are a couple reasons why poverty emerges as a critical issue in the 1960s. One is the post-war period is generally, with a few exceptions, a period of affluence. Uh, Despite the fact that the vast majority of Americans were better off economically in the 1950s and the 1960s than was certainly the case in the 1930s, there are important sectors of the American public that are falling behind, that are not doing as well. And this was perhaps illustrated best with the publication of The Other America by Michael Harrington in 1962, where he identified sectors of the American public uh, the elderly, uh, people who were living in rural areas, uh, the Puerto Rican community, urban, certain urban communities who were uh, suffering from economic deprivation, from poverty, from high rates of unemployment. And um, Harrington's book really generated a lot of discussion, a lot of political discourse about the question of poverty and how to bring these various communities into what was considered the mainstream of American society at that time. Harrington didn't particularly concern himself with racial differences. He was more concerned with rural, urban, and class-based splits. Uh, can you tell us something about why race is an important factor to focus on? Well, I think the other source of thinking about why the poverty discourses emerges in the 1960s is the civil rights movement. And we often think about the civil rights movement in terms of the struggles around Jim Crow segregation in the South. The image of the lunch counter, of the segregated lunch counter, is a prominent one, I think, when people talk about the struggle for civil rights. But in fact, the question of economic justice and rights was an um, integral component of the struggle for civil rights. If we look at the 1963 March on Washington, for example, that brought 250,000 people to uh, Washington, D.C., and this was where Martin Luther King gave his very famous I Have a Dream speech, that march was a march for jobs and freedom. And curious here because here's a place where the civil rights movement, the uh, war against poverty, which we'll talk about in a minute, and the anti-war movement, the jobs movement, unionization, all come together in a way. And we don't yet have gender in there, but let's switch to talking a little bit about the war on poverty and how that emerges in part from that march on Washington in 1963. Absolutely, so the struggle for economic justice was uh, a very important part of the struggle for civil rights. Uh, much of the civil rights movement was initially focused on the South, but once the passage, uh, once the civil rights bill was passed in 1964 and the voting rights bill was passed in 1965, many people in the civil rights community began to think much more deeply about other forms of racism, especially the ways in which African Americans were denied access to certain kinds of jobs, the way in which residential segregation uh, limited the economic opportunities of African Americans. And this became most evident, I think, in the urban rebellions in the late 1960s, in the mid and the late 1960s. So Watts exploded in race riots in 1965. Uh, Detroit had a massive rebellion in 1967. And I think these were indications of, those, of the way in which poor black communities in urban centers were feeling that they, that their 
concerns and their issues had not been fully addressed by either the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act. So do you think that these uh, urban rebellions pushed President Lyndon Baines Johnson into what we've come to call the war on poverty? Absolutely. The origins of the war on poverty actually lie with John F. Kennedy when he toured Appalachia in 1961. He was very concerned about especially rural white poverty. This was also a concern of Michael Harrington when he published The Other America in 1962. The ways in which poor rural white people had been marginalized, had were dealing with uh, problems of unemployment, lack of job training. Um, the urban rebellions, I think, pushed the war on poverty to expand its scope and to deal not just with poor rural white people but also with the problems of urban poverty and communities of color in particular. And these problems of poverty, they're occurring side by side with the expansion of the war in Vietnam which actually brings a measure of affluence to some segments of America. I think there was a big contradiction between uh, the amount of money that was being spent uh, to fight the war in Vietnam and the amount of money that was devoted to the war on poverty domestically. And a number of civil rights leaders, including Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, made the point about the ways in which money was being diverted from what could have been very important social programs and anti-poverty measures uh, domestically, the ways in which that money had been devoted to fighting this war abroad. Mm -hmm. And we understand this in terms of Lyndon Johnson's choice between guns and butter. And uh, some people say the war on poverty failed. I don't know that it failed. I think it actually achieved some important things. But I don't think that the war on poverty uh, was fought with as much resources as it could have been in order to be truly successful. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason for that was because of the war in Vietnam. Well, tell us a little bit about the differential effects of the war on poverty or the differential aims of the war on poverty on uh, black people and white people, on women and men, uh, on urban and rural people. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, the crux of the war on poverty was education and job opportunity, job training and job opportunity. So the thrust of the war on poverty was trying to figure out how to prepare people, how to train people to enter the workforce successfully. There was much less emphasis in the war on poverty on transforming the American economy. Uh, the emphasis was really on transforming the individual in order to fit into the current American economy. So Head Start, for example, was a core program that grew out of Head Start. There were manpower development and training programs. Most of the core programs of the War on Poverty centered on education and job training. Programs like Head Start, programs on manpower development and training. Uh, another important component of the War on Poverty were the community action programs, which gave poor people in particular uh, the resources and the, the ability to be able to participate in community programs and to decide for themselves the ways in which they could be empowered as community members. And we should probably add Medicaid and Medicare, which right. are perhaps not central to the war on poverty, but they certainly come at about the same time. Right. But here's the question I want to ask you. So here's this war on poverty directed at changing individuals, but it seems to me looking at the data that it really is directed other than the Head Start program, which of course is directed at all children, the programs are directed at improving the lives of male people <laughs> rather than females in general. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, the war on poverty 
because of its emphasis on employment and job training and education really was geared towards male unemployment. It was geared towards uh, stabilizing what people considered the heterosexual two-parent family, which was the crux uh, and the engine of the American economy. So many of the job training programs were indeed centered on uh, communities where men were unable to find jobs. And what's the theory behind this? I mean, after all, in African-American communities especially, women had been working, earning a living, supporting families for years, decades. Uh, why the focus on men? In this period, when there were discussions about poverty and how to alleviate poverty, there were simultaneously discourses about single parent families and the ways in which single parent families were dysfunctional. Uh, perhaps the person who articulated this uh, most powerfully was Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was Secretary of Labor in the Johnson administration. And Moynihan published a report in 1965 that was titled The Negro Family, A Case for National Action. In that report, Moynihan identified uh, single mothers in the African-American community as really the prime reason for the ongoing problem of urban poverty. And Moynihan, like many other people, Democrats, Republicans, civil rights activists, community organizers, began to think about and understand single motherhood as the source of and as the problem of poverty. Their solutions, in many cases, became one to reestablish and to restore the two-parent heterosexual family, which for them meant a man who was the breadwinner and a mother who would take care of the children and stay at home. So this was really, in some sense, an attempt to restore or reinvent or to invent a new a breadwinner family in a community or among people who had in some sense never been able to rely on a male breadwinner because of job discrimination and racial discrimination in general in the society. So there's a bit of a contradiction here. We're going to create jobs and, and train men for jobs and we're going to leave the women who've always been responsible for, or at least partly responsible for supporting families out of these programs. The breadwinner ideology was a dominant ideology uh, throughout the 20th century. And it was really an ideal that many families aspired to. It was also really central to social policy, the ways in which government policy played itself out. Uh, was often centered on the idea of a male breadwinner and a female homemaker. It's absolutely true that poor communities, African American women, Puerto Rican women, Native American women and families did not fit this model of the breadwinner ideology. I think that um, there was greater effort in the 1960s and the 1970s to have African American families fit this ideal model. But I also think that one of the main criticisms of African American single mother families in this period really centered on the politics of welfare. So it wasn't simply that these women didn't have husbands. The bigger problem for most people, including Moynihan when he wrote about this, was that these single mother families are relying on the state for assistance. It is a drain on public resources. It is destructive to uh, their family life. Um, and more importantly was this idea of what they call the culture of dependency. Um, and the culture of dependency suggested that what many identified as a dysfunction, that is single parent families, which I don't actually think is dysfunctional, um, but that dysfunction of being in a single parent family is actually one that is passed down from generation to generation. So a single parent family will breed more single parent families. And so there's a cycle of dependency and the dependency is of course dependency on welfare assistance. So just to follow this through a little bit, 
The issue here then is not that African American women are working, but that they're not working and they're dependent on what we've come to call welfare or aid to dependent children, aid to families of dependent children. Uh, how do women, and uh, I should make it clear here that more than half, probably about 60% of the people taking government aid or welfare are white, you know, poor, often rural, though sometimes urban people, but that the proportion of African Americans taking welfare in proportion to their uh, numbers in society was greater and so people began to identify welfare as black incorrectly but nevertheless with huge consequences. But to back up a little bit, so how did welfare then become the target of uh, what, or was it the target of the war on poverty? How did the war on poverty deal with welfare? And how did women who were on welfare, if you like, respond? Mm -hmm. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the history of welfare. So when welfare, the aid to families with dependent children, was initiated in 1935, it was designed to support uh, women without a breadwinner in their role as mothers. So women got a very meager, but they got a stipend to help them uh, raise their children. Uh, welfare in the 1930s and the 1940s was racially exclusive. That is, most uh, states, most welfare offices denied welfare assistance to women of color. Beginning in the late 1950s, in part because of black migration, an increasing number of African-American women as well as Puerto Rican women who were coming from the island to the mainland in the 1950s began to apply for welfare assistance. So this shift in the racial composition is absolutely important because it uh, does transform the way in which people talk about welfare. Mm -hmm. And so you're right, there is a growing identification of the welfare system with women of color, even though they are not a majority of welfare assistance. But I think the racialized politics of welfare are incredibly important uh, for why the program comes under attack. Um, and I think the, it's partly about the way public dollars are spent, the assumptions that people are making that their public dollars are going to assist people who are engaged in immoral behavior, who are lazy, who are not good mothers, uh, who have multiple sexual partners, things like that. So the politics of morality are absolutely central to how the public identifies and thinks about uh, the welfare program. It's curious to me that in 1967, when the federal government for the first time passes a mandate that women on welfare, even those with children, should be asked to work, it doesn't yet mandate that all of them do work, but here's the first or the beginning of the workfare requirements. And this is happening at exactly the moment when more affluent women are flooding into the labor force. So why do women on welfare resist this mandate to work? So yes, in 1967, uh, the first mandatory work requirements are instituted on the federal level. And these are instituted in part because African-American women are identified as undeserving of assistance. And the historian Michael Katz has talked about those welfare recipients who are identified as deserving, who are good and worthy mothers, and those who are undeserving, who are unworthy mothers, and those are very often women of color. Uh, and it's a real shift in the ways in which welfare had historically been perceived, away from a program that was designed to support women in their work as mothers and becoming a program that uh, is increasingly requiring those very same women to take a job uh, outside the home. 
Um, and so I think the 1967 amendments are a really important indication of the ways in which welfare policy was transforming in this period. Uh, the welfare rights movement was a political movement of poor women of color. It was a multiracial movement. So it included Native American women, Latina women, white women, and African American women. Back up a little bit and let, let me ask. Mm -hmm. So how do women respond, pick up before the welfare rights movement? Well, tell I, I tell us about. when the welfare rights movement is created and in part because of the larger context of civil rights organizing, of community organizing, and the funds from the War on Poverty that uh, were allocated to community programs and community organizing programs, women on welfare began to meet in their own neighborhoods, in their own communities. These were sometimes kitchen table meetings where women in their housing projects would gather with other welfare recipients and talk about many of the inequalities and the injustices they faced in the welfare system. It might be uh, how somebody was cut off welfare. It might mean that they were denied additional funding to be able to buy some winter clothing for their children. But these conversations became the basis for what would eventually become a national movement of welfare recipients. There were small organizations started, one in Watts, Los Angeles in 1962. Uh, there were a number of groups in New York City that began in 1964 and in 1965. Um, and these women began to think about and address the racial inequality and the kind of surveillance that was central to the welfare program, the ways in which caseworkers wielded an enormous amount of power over their day-to-day -day lives and could determine um, how much assistance they would get and when they might not get that assistance any longer. One of the tactics that caseworkers sometimes used was known as the midnight raids, where they would show up at a recipient's house in the middle of the night looking for evidence that a man was in the house. And if they did in fact find a man's shoe or a razor in the bathroom, that would be evidence that the welfare recipient was engaged in an intimate relationship with a man and would be grounds for cutting her and her children off of assistance. And so these kinds of practices that were really invasive uh, in terms of the daily lives of welfare recipients um, were part of the reason why uh, women began to come together and talk about how, the, how they could transform the welfare system. Their women seem to be stuck in a conundrum if they don't have men around, they're violating Daniel Patrick Moynihan's sense of breadwinner family necessity. They do have men around, they're cut off from support. So, uh, you know, they can't win. Absolutely. And I don't think there was any um, real expectation that African American women would not work. I think the kind of longstanding history of African American women was one that they would be employed. And they had been employed from the moment, uh, from the very earliest days of this country when they worked as slaves and in the post-war uh, post period, the post-Civil War period as well. And, and of course the ideology of the moment, at least for white women, was that motherhood was work. Absolutely. There was a real uh, contradiction in the late 1950s and early 60s about expectations for women. So if you look at some of the social science literature of this period, there was a lot of political discourse about the ways in which uh, the employment of white middle class women was actually damaging to their children because those children were not getting the time and attention that they needed from their mothers. Whereas there's a parallel literature at the very same time about poor African American women and how if they are not working, that they are in fact dam damaging their children, children because they are contributing to this culture of poverty and the notion of dependency. Right. So when the National Welfare Rights Organization gets started and starts moving, are they claiming the right of mothers to stay at home? Are they claiming the right of women to be trained for good jobs? What, what, what is it that they're actually looking for? 
the welfare rights movement is looking for several things. They are looking for um, a basic minimum standard of living. Okay, so they want welfare checks to reflect the cost of living uh, for families. Um, they are also advocating that women have a choice. So they're not suggesting that poor women have to stay home and take care of their children, but they certainly don't want to be put in a position where poor women are required to take paid employment outside the home. So what they fundamentally want is for women, poor women, to have the same kinds of choice about staying at home and caring for their children or taking paid employment that middle class women have. Mm. And the National Welfare Rights Organization itself, is that run by women? And when, what's its heyday? Can you tell us something about it? It was actually founded by a, uh, an African American man who was a chemistry professor who was teaching at Syracuse University. His name is George Wiley. Um, and George Wiley was a longtime civil rights activist who became deeply concerned about questions of poverty um, and especially the problems of uh, welfare assistance. He hooked up with two other individuals, Richard Cloward and Francis Fox Piven, and they began to think about ways in which they could develop a national movement to help reform welfare policy. So George Wiley was really the leader behind the formation of the National Welfare Rights Organization, and he convened a meeting in Chicago in 1966 to bring together welfare recipients from around the country who had already been organizing in their local communities. And that 1966 meeting was really the launching pad for the National Welfare Rights Organization. Uh, and they organized a nationwide march that year. Um, and the organization existed until 1975. And who were its members? Were they actually recipients of welfare or were they other concerned people? Most of the staff of the National Welfare Rights Organization were uh, men or non-recipients or white people. Most of the grassroots membership of the welfare rights movement were African American women. About 90% of the membership was African American women. So there was uh, actually some tension and conflict between the largely male leadership and the largely female recipients um, around the question of work. Uh, Many of the male staff members of the National Welfare Rights Organization wanted to push back against the larger political discourse that African American women were lazy and didn't want to work, and that's why they were on welfare. And their strategy for dealing with that vicious political discourse was to suggest, well, actually, these women do want to work. The problem is they can't find jobs or they can't find good jobs. So. Um, their approach was to uh, push for greater job opportunities for African American women. The vast majority of the membership of the welfare rights movement had a slightly different take in that they advocated the right to either stay home and take care of their children or to take paid employment outside the home. And so I think what distinguished them was a desire to place greater value on their work as mothers and to recognize and acknowledge the important work of mothering and the ways in which taking care of children is actually a very important public service. And women do that uh, as mothers. Women uh, are raising the next generation of citizens. They're raising the next generation of workers. And so women in the welfare rights movement really wanted to bring greater value to the work of mothering. But I'm conscious of the fact that here we are in the early part of the 1970s, moving through the 70s, and we've got well-educated women, more affluent women, opening the doors to universities, pushing for really good, well-paying jobs, walking away from motherhood, if you like, at the same time as African American women are saying, no, no, we have a right to mother. We, we need to stay at home with our children. So uh, talk to me about how legislatures um, respond to this. You know, what are the consequences of this contradiction in the 
the halls of policymakers and and courtrooms. The larger context of the women's movement of the 1960s and the 1970s, which saw employment opportunities outside the home as a primary path to personal liberation, had a profound influence on how welfare policy was seen and sort of how welfare, uh, how welfare policy unfolded in the 1960s and the 1970s. Uh, so after the uh, passage of the 1967 work requirements for welfare, we began to see more and more conversation and expectations that women on welfare ought to be working as well. And this kind of becomes uh, a core feature of welfare reform forever after. And it ultimately culminates in the 1996 welfare reform legislation signed by Bill Clinton, which essentially uh, dismantles the welfare system altogether. I, I, I know that that 1996 reform is called the Personal Responsibility Act, and it of course avoids the entire problem of motherhood and you know op available opportunities, and simply argues that everybody, men and women, mothers and non-mothers, are all responsible for themselves in the end, that the federal government will provide block grants to states to help out a little bit for as much as five years, but as we know, even that is not taken advantage of by states, and state after state has since then cut down those grants. So essentially now, there is no more welfare program. There is no more entitlement. There is no more guarantee that a mother of a child will be able to stay home and raise that child. That's right. There's very, very little social or economic support for single parents, whether they're men or women, um, today. And we've seen dramatic increases in levels of poverty, especially what social scientists call deep poverty. And these are families that are living on less than $2 a day. That's even taking into account the kinds of social supports, food stamps, and things that they might be getting. So there has been a real concentration of people who are incredibly impoverished in this country. And most scholars attribute it attribute that to uh, the dismantling of the welfare system and other kinds of support for poor communities.